Hey there, Joe Massey here with Castle & Cook Mortgage. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to finance condos and townhomes. There's a lot of misconceptions out there, a lot of folks that think it's difficult to finance a condo, difficult to finance a townhome, or you can't uh, get this homeowners association approved or that homeowners association approved for X, Y, Z reason. Today we're really gonna dive into those details, talk about the difference between a condo and townhome, talk about why it's important and exactly how you can help your buyers qualify for these properties. If you're new here, again, my name is Joe Massey with Castle & Cook Mortgage, and I focus on helping home buyers purchase new properties, whether it's their first property, their second, their 10th property, investment properties, uh, second homes in the mountains, just about any type of permanent residential financing. So excited to have you here with us today. So if you're a home buyer, hopefully this will have some great information for you. If you're a real estate agent, hopefully it will have a lot of great information for you as well. Let's get started with what are we going to cover today? Number one, what is a condo and a townhome? And then how to tell the difference which is a really, really important piece that a lot of folks uh, need some clarity around or don't 100% understand. Number two, why does it matter? Why do you care? If you're a home buyer or you're a real estate agent, why do you care if the property is a townhome or a condo? We're really gonna dive into that because that's a really important distinction. How to finance each type of property. That's obviously what I focus on is mortgage lending and mortgage finance. And we're gonna walk you through how to get new loans on each of these property types. And we're gonna talk about warrantable versus non-warrantable. And if you're not familiar with what that is, that's okay. That's something that you may not have heard those phrases or you may not have heard those terms in the past, but these are important things to understand, particularly surrounding condo financing. And then we're gonna cover some concerns and gotchas to make sure that you watch out for. So first off, what is a condo and townhome? So condominiums and townhomes or townhouses are broadly categorized as forms of housing structures, both terms being widely used in North America. Thank you, Mr. Webster, for the definition, but what does that really mean? All right, a condominium is a housing structure that is part of a bigger unit or building, and the owner owns the condo and the interior of that unit independently, and the other services in the building are jointly owned with other condo owners. So looking at this example, maybe you own just that unit right there, but the hallways and the common areas and the common grounds, that's owned uh, as part of your fractional ownership with the homeowners association. Now, a townhome looks a lot like this. It's a style of homes where a row of houses share walls, but the owner actually owns the ground underneath, all right? So your unit stops right there, all right? The next neighbor, their unit stops right there, but you own the ground underneath that unit. And that's a really important distinction uh, for what is that property and how is it appropriately titled. So what's the difference, all right? In short, a condominium is the ownership of the interior of the unit, all right? Meaning it's a part of a housing structure that's part of a bigger unit or building, and you own only the interior, all right? So from the studs on the walls, you own from halfway through that stud in, and then maybe your neighbor owns from halfway through the stud over to their unit, or if you're on an exterior wall, uh, the homeowners association owns the exterior of the building and that HOA is responsible for the day-to-day -day maintenance of the building, the exterior, and any common areas. And you could be on any floor. You might be on the first floor, second, 10th, fifth, who knows, but it can be on any floor. Now, townhouse means that you own the interior of the unit and the ground underneath the unit. So that picture we saw before, it's really like a style of homes where all the homes are in a row, and most importantly, you own the land. All right, you own the dirt underneath that, uh, that unit. And it's always gonna be on the ground floor, but you may see two, three, four story townhomes, but it's always going to start on the ground floor because you own that dirt underneath the unit. Now, how can you tell the difference? All right, when you're looking at a property, can you look at it and say, hey, I can just glance and see that this property is a condo. Well, if it's on the second or third floor, yeah, that's pretty easy. But what if it's on the first floor? What if it looks like a townhouse? That can be a challenge. One of my favorites, the MLS. All right, can you look in the MLS and that will tell you exactly what it is. We're gonna look at some scenarios on that. What about the appraiser? All right, do they always know, yep, this is a condo or yep, this is a townhome? Generally, yes, but we have seen some challenges around that. Or another one, what if you've got a unit number? All right, or what if it is just an individual property address without a unit number? Or one of my favorites, 
the county assessor. All right, this is a real common way to look up and see what type of property do we have. So I'll pause for a minute and I want you to think about it. Which one of these seems like the best way to determine what you have? You know what the answer is? None of the above. What you want to look at is the legal description. All right, none of these things up here, visual description, MLS, appraisal, unit number, county assessor, individual property address, none of these are a foolproof way to tell what type of property you have. You have to look at the actual legal description of the property in order to know what type of property you're working with. So let's look at a couple of sample legal descriptions. All right, so unit number one here, condominium unit number 16 in the well-born condominiums. A condominium in accordance with and subject to the declarations of covenants, conditions, etc., from you know 1980, book 2288. Lots of big words here that it is in the city and county of Denver on this map, etc. Well, pretty easy to tell this is a condo. Okay, let's look at sample legal description number two. All right, lot 75, block one in the Granville West subdivision, filing one, city and county of Denver. What do you guys think this is? That's right, it's a townhouse. The way you can tell is that lot and block legal description because it is a lot, lot number 75, as a portion of block number one in the Granville West subdivision. Now let's look at one that's a little more challenging. I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, but let's get an idea here. A portion of lots 15 to 24 inclusive in block one in the gray subdivision of lots one and 16 in the maple grove subdivision together with this west 20 feet of java court adjoining said lots in the east vacated by ordinance number 476 in 1963 in the city and county of denver particularly described as commencing etc 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 holy cow that's kind of a big legal description so this first one up here number two that's what's known as a lot and block legal description. Number three, this is what's known as a meets and bounds. And the way you can tell that is it starts at a point of beginning. If you remember back to your survey class, uh, if you took that in college like I did, it always starts at a point of beginning and then you measure out these distances on a map. So when we're measuring out distances on a map, that would lead you to believe that there is measurements on the map including some dirt, meaning that this is a, that's right, townhouse, all right? So if you see a lot and block legal description, or if you see a meets and bounds legal description, you are dealing with a condo, all right? So let's look at some sample legal descriptions from the county assessors. So the first we're gonna look at is Arapahoe County Assessors. Great folks over there, they do a great job. If we just quickly glance at this, Sturbridge at Homestead, phase number one through four, land use. This is a townhome. But legal description, unit 5-3, building five, as per condo declaration, recorded uh, in book number 3676. Let's look a little further down on the assessor's page. Land use, same page, same website, attached condominium. So on the exact same website, we've got some conflicting information here. So that goes back to what I was saying earlier. You can't always go off of visual observation or the county assessor. You really wanna look at the legal description. So what does this legal description say? It's right here in the very first word, condominium unit 5-3, okay? So what type of property do we have? This is a condo, that's right, all right? Let's look at another sample legal description. Denver County Assessor. Again, great folks over there. They do a great job. Property type, line number one, residential condominium. Seems pretty easy. However, legal description, Prospect Park Townhomes, unit number 84. Let's look at the legal description here. Unit 84 in Prospect Park, according to this annexation and non-inundated land survey, there's a hint, that portion of the northeast quarter, northwest quarter, southwest quarter meets and bounds. What's this telling you? Starting all the way here at a point of beginning. Guess what? Townhouse. All right. So I want to kind of reiterate this point. You really have to look at that legal description to know what type of property you're dealing with. And I'll give you a real quick uh, story about this particular property. 
client was under contract to purchase the property and they had gone through seven different lenders and had been turned down by all seven of those lenders for the same reason. They said, you know what, we're trying to buy this condo and uh, Joe, can you help us with it? We've been turned down by seven other lenders and we need to get an FHA loan, but the condo is not on the FHA approval list. And I said, absolutely, let's take a look at it. Let's see what's going on. Well, what do you know, and we're gonna talk about this later, it was not on the FHA approved condo list because it's not a condo. And so seven different lenders had made this error prior to these clients calling us. We were able to take their application and close on this transaction two weeks later by simply understanding what is the legal description and what type of property is it. So that's why it goes back to that point of why it's really important for you to know what it is. So now let's look at a sample property in the MLS, okay? Townhouse, all right, we look here at the legal description in the MLS, subdivision Highland Townhomes Condo Association. Now that's a little tricky, right? It's a townhome condo association. So is it a townhouse or a condo? And let's look at it, all right? It's all uh, two story, maybe like a split level here. And we've got something right here, like a dividing wall. And we are on the first floor. What do we think it might be? Let's take a look at the legal description condominium unit number 14518 in the Highlands Townhome Condominium Association. All right, so guess what this is? This is a, not a townhouse, this is a condo. All right, so really important to grasp that, that it really comes back to what does this legal description say? And just because it says townhouse in the MLS, that doesn't mean that's exactly what it is. So if you're a buyer or you're a real estate agent out there and you're looking at properties, you wanna double check that legal description as you're looking at homes to understand exactly what you're looking at and is this a property that makes sense for the type of finance we're doing? Does this make sense for the type of property that we want to buy? So now we know what type of property we have, but a really important question, why do we even care? Joe, I just want to buy a house. I don't care if it's a condo or townhouse. I just want to buy something. Okay, that's fair. I hear that a lot from clients, but here's why it's important. Mortgages have different qualifications for townhouses versus condos, all right? And you want to make sure that you or your buyer can actually close on the property. If they're pre-approved to buy a townhouse and they get under contract on a condo, maybe that could trip them up. All right, and if you're listing a property or you're selling your property, you wanna make sure that you're advertising it properly so that people that are searching on the MLS can find the property that they want and they really can close. So it's an important distinction to understand what type of property you have. And there's some financing nuances. So let's talk about that first for townhomes. All right, for townhomes, if you're getting a conventional loan, it is the exact same guidelines as a single family residence. If you're getting an FHA loan, it is the exact same guidelines as a single family residence. If you're getting a VA loan, again, the exact same guidelines as a single family residence. So what exactly are the nuances for townhomes? None, all right? Qualifying for a townhome is exactly the same as a single family residence. We're of course going to factor in the cost of the homeowners association, but there are no additional restrictions or requirements when you're purchasing a townhome as compared to a single family residence. So really important, that's where it comes back to if somebody wants a townhome um, and they don't want a condo, you know, the financing is gonna be exactly the same for that buyer uh, when they're purchasing a townhome as if it were just like a single family residence. Now, what about the nuances for condos? First off, let's talk about conventional loans, all right? There's gonna be a phrase you're gonna hear called warrantable versus non-warrantable. Really simple definition. Warrantable means that that project is eligible for conventional financing and eligible for mortgage insurance, all right? Non-warrantable, really simply means not eligible, all right? And so if you find a condo that's non-warrantable, which we're gonna talk about, you might need some alternative financing. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So how do we determine if a project is warrantable or non-warrantable? Well, it depends on the amount of money that you're putting down. 
So if you're an owner occupant buyer and you're putting 10% down or more, we're going to do a limited review. It's real simple. I'll show you exactly how it works. If you're buying an investment property and you're putting 25% down or more, we're also going to do that same limited review. What if you're putting down less than that though? What if you're an owner occupant putting down three or five percent? All right, you're not doing that 10% down. Now we're going to do a full review. Or if you're an investment property purchaser and you're putting down less than 25%, don't forget you can put down as little as 15 or even 20%, or you can do that 25% down on an investment property. And we're going to do that full review if you're doing that 15 or 20% down payment option. Now, what if you're getting an FHA loan? All right, for an FHA loan, the condo must be on that FHA approval list. Okay, and you just go to this website right here, and I'll show you exactly how it works. And you type in the condo information, and you can determine very quickly if that project is FHA approved. Or what about VA? If you're buying a condo and it's a VA loan, it must be on that VA approval list. And you would go right to this website. Now, here's a really important point not the same lists, all right? FHA and VA have independent approval lists and you wanna be sure that you look at both lists. If you've got an FHA buyer or maybe a VA buyer and you check one list or the other and you're checking the wrong one, you might be in for a little bit of frustration as you get involved in the transaction. So be sure to check both approval lists depending on the type of loan that you're getting or the type of loan your buyer is getting. So let's start with conventional though, and let's look at this limited review. Now I know it's really small for you guys on the screen. You don't have to worry about all the details. I'm just gonna cover the high level important points for you. So number one, owner occupant putting 10% down or an investor putting at least 25% down. We're gonna ask, it's just one page. We send it over to the homeowners association, ask them to fill out these 15 questions. And what are the areas that could really trip you up the most common problems you're going to see would be question number four. Is the homeowners association involved in any active or pending litigation? That's going to be a big problem. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Question number five, individual ownership of greater than 20% of the total units in the project. So if you've got somebody that owns 25% of the project, that gives one individual or one entity a lot of power over the homeowners association. That can be a problem when you're doing a limited review. Or question number 12, special assessments. Are there any pending special assessments coming down from the HOA? Not that that's a bad thing because sometimes special assessments are good because we're gonna upgrade the property or redo the pool or the common areas, but it can also be an insight into financial troubles with the homeowners association. So these are the common areas that will trip you up in a limited review. Now, what if you're putting down less than that 10% for a primary residence or less than 25% as an investor? Well, now we're gonna do a full review. And this uh, is actually about a five page document, uh, but I've shortened it down just so it can all be on one slide here for what are the most important things we're looking at. Again, if you're putting down less than that 10% or less than 25% as an investor, this is where we're going to do a full review of the condo complex. So what are the most common problems? Um, again, litigation. Is the homeowners association involved in any active or pending litigation? Number two, delinquencies. How many unit owners are 60 days or more behind in their uh, HOA dues? The reason that's important is that is a leading indicator for foreclosures. If they're behind on their HOA dues, they're likely also behind on their mortgage, also behind on their tax bill, and that can be an indication of coming foreclosures and coming problems within the HOA. Next one, special assessments. We spoke about that on the last slide. Special assessments can be an indication of financial, financial trouble for the HOA. Not necessarily, again, maybe they're doing upgrades, but it can be an issue that we're just gonna have to research. Does the HOA have at least 10% of their annual budget being funded for replacement reserves? So a lot of folks say, well, Joe, why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal just like for you and I, you should be saving 10% of your paycheck into savings for unexpected things that come up. 
Um, so if you're a homeowner, you might be saving 10% of your check for if you ever have to replace the roof or you ever have damage to your water heater or future landscaping projects. Same concept for a homeowners association. All the money that they're bringing in every month, they should be budgeting to put 10% aside for future repairs and maintenance of the exterior and the common areas. So if it's less than 10%, that can be an indication that maybe there's gonna be a special assessment coming or maybe there's some financial challenges with the homeowners association. Next one, investor concentration. All right, if you're purchasing as a primary residence, we are not concerned about investor concentration. So I want to repeat that because that's a big one. A lot of folks call me and say, Joe, uh, there's 75% investors in this project, so it's non-warrantable. Well, maybe. It's non-warrantable if you're an investor and you're putting down less than 25%, you do have to have at least 50% owner concentration. However, if you're buying as a primary residence, your new home is going to be owner occupied, investor concentration is not a concern. So we get that question a lot when folks say, hey, there's too many investors, I can't get a loan in there. It depends. Depends on how much you're putting down. Depends on what type of ownership you're going to have of the property. So I don't expect you to memorize that. Just a really good reminder. Call me if you run into investor concentration. Very likely that we can help. And then commercial use. All right, this is a big one. Um, you see this a lot in uh, condo complexes downtown is we want to see how much of that building is being used for commercial or non-residential purposes. And it's okay if the first or second floor are being used as a hair salon or a gym or things like that. You know, we see that a lot with some of the high-rise condos downtown. We just need to see what is that percentage and how much is being used for commercial purposes and how much is being used for residential purposes. Now, when we get a full review like this, we do need some supporting documents. So the number one thing we need is that questionnaire. That's the document that I just went over. Again, it's about five pages long. I shortened, you know, to show you guys on one slide what are the key areas. We also need a copy of that annual budget. That's where we're going to be looking at the reserves, looking to see if there's any potential special assessments. We need a copy of the master insurance policy. It's really important to make sure that a large complex and if a buyer is putting down less than 10% or less than 25% uh, for that um, investment property, that the property is appropriately insured. And then we're also going to be looking for that fidelity insurance. And this is real common um, for large complexes. If they're greater than 20 units, they need to have fidelity insurance. Um, because there's likely a lot of money in the HOA operating account and in that reserve account. This insurance is covering against any theft from HOA board members or employee theft, things like that. Gathering all of this information and then you send it over to us and here at Castle & Cook Mortgage we're going to review and get you a decision on this complex within 24 hours. Now why is that really important? All right, a real common thing that we hear in the industry is many lenders don't do this step until very late in the approval process. We complete this right up front so there are no surprises. I get at least two or three calls a month where somebody calls me and says, you know what, Joe, um, we're scheduled to close in three days and we just found out that the project is non-warrantable. Can you help? Yes, absolutely we can help. We're going to work on it with you. Um, that's a great reason to reach out so that we can help. But one of the challenges that always surprises me is so many lenders don't do that step until very late in the approval process. We do it right up front so you're not hit with any surprises while you're under contract on this new property. So what are the items that can make a project non-warrantable? I'm going to hit this one again that we spoke about earlier. Occupancy. If you are buying as a primary residence or as a second homeowner, we are not worried about the owner occupancy or investor concentration. However, if you are a non-owner occupant purchaser, you're buying the property as an investment property, if you're putting at least 25% down, then we're not concerned about it. However, if you're putting less than 25% down, you need at least 50% owner concentration. All right. Reserves, we touched on this one just a little bit. You really want to see at least 10% of that annual budget going into the reserve account and budgeted per year. Delinquencies, less than 15% delinquencies. If you're going into a homeowners association and there's 25, 30, 40% delinquency, 
very likely that you might have 25, 30, 40 percent foreclosures in that complex coming up. Ownership by an, a single entity. No more than one person or entity can own greater than 20 percent of the complex. And there are a few of these in Denver. There's actually one um, over in Lakewood where one owner owns like 75 percent of the HOA. They're great rental units and every time one of the units comes up for sale, that individual owner actually buys that unit because other folks have trouble getting them financed, other folks have trouble buying them, and they're great rentals. But it does give one individual person on the Homeowners Association a lot of control and a lot of power in that HOA and in that complex. Other items to watch out for, litigation. This is a big one, guys. There's probably half a dozen uh, homeowners association in the Denver area that are currently going through litigation. It's real common for construction defect, um, real common for challenges with insurance after a hailstorm. If the insurance maybe disagrees with how much work needs to be done um, and the HOA says, hey, you know what, we're going to have to go into litigation with the insurance company to get these repairs made. Um, those can be long and really costly for an HOA to go into that. And when that happens, um, a lawsuit is going to prevent that HOA from being warrantable. All right, very, very rare to have exceptions on that. The only one I've ever seen is there's a really big complex over in East Denver, and they have about $6 million in reserves. And they had on staff landscapers and on staff maintenance folks, and um, they did have to eliminate one of their maintenance people, and he actually sued the HOA for back overtime pay. And it went to small claims court, and it was about a $3,500 lawsuit. And so when we sent over the uh, questionnaire, they did check yes, they're great over at that HOA, and they checked yes, we are involved in litigation. And I asked them for some information on it. They sent me a copy of it and said, hey, you know, we're being sued in small claims court for back overtime, and the total is $3,500. They had more than $6 million in reserves. We said, hey, even if they lose, they're still gonna be out only $3,500 and they still have greater than $6 million in reserves, we're not concerned with that. But outside of those really tiny lawsuits like that, very, very rare to have any exceptions. So if you're looking at a project that is involved in litigation, just assume that it's gonna be more difficult to finance that. And we touched earlier on commercial space. No more than 35% of the building can be used for commercial space. So think about it, if you've got a, five-story complex and the first two stories are commercial, you're approximately 40% being used for commercial space, it's gonna be really difficult to get a loan for your residential buyers on floors number three, four, and five. But maybe it's a 10-story complex and the first two stories are being used for commercial, well, you still have 80% being used for residential space, no problem. Fidelity insurance, we do need to make sure they've got sufficient insurance to cover all of their reserves and cash on hand. And then condo tells. We did not touch on this, but these are real common up in the mountains. So a condo tell is something that looks like this. You might see in Keystone, Breckenridge. Uh, looks, acts, feels like a hotel, but is actually a condo. That is going to be not eligible, all right? Not for any conventional financing anyways. Um, condo tells can be great properties, great to own, great as ski condos, but you do have to get usually financing through the local bank like Alpine Bank or First Bank are really, really good for these condo tell types of properties. So let's look at a couple of sample properties in the MLS. And I wanna talk a little bit about FHA, all right? So I think we've got a real good understanding of conventional. So this project, um, I've taken the address off here because um, don't want to you know, be sharing any inaccurate information, um, but really a nice condo, looks great here. Um, they've got it listed as a condo and uh, it says it's eligible for cash, of course, conventional, FHA, and VA loans. So conventional, we assume it's going to be in great shape for us to go through a limited or a full review. And FHA and VA, we need to make sure we look on the condo approval website for FHA and VA loans. But first, before we do that, let's be sure that it's a condo. All right, legal description, condominium unit number, I blocked that out. In the promontory in accordance with declarations, etc. this is, you guessed it, a condo. So really good job, the agent has appropriately listed this as a condo. They came to my class and uh, researched exactly what type of property it is. So we do have it listed properly in the MLS. And now we're gonna double check that it is FHA and VA approved. 
So let's take a look at the FHA approval website and confirm that this project is truly FHA approved. All right, so this is the FHA approval list for zip code 80237, which is where this project is located. And I found it here on the list. We've got the promontory, that was the name of it, um, and 72 units, six buildings, and it is approved, except, whoops, that approval has expired. All right, so this project is no longer approved. So depending on when the agent put this into the MLS, it may have been approved prior to when they put it into the MLS, but it is now expired. Why is that important? Well, what if you've got a buyer that only has 3.5% down and they only qualify for an FHA loan? And they go out and they look at properties and they fall in love with this one and it says, hey, it is FHA approved. Great, you get under contract, you get started, everybody's excited, and then one's the, what is one of the first things we're gonna do? Double check that FHA approval list, and then when we find out that, oh no, it is expired, that buyer is not gonna be able to buy this property, all right? And there's very few things that are more frustrating than a buyer falling in love with the property and then not being able to purchase it. So it's really important, if you're showing uh, condos to a buyer and they need an FHA loan, make sure you're cross-referencing against this FHA approval list because you're gonna to wanna to make sure that that project truly is approved so that if they fall in love with that property, that they truly can close on it. Now let's also take a look and see if this project is VA approved, all right? So again, reminder, different website, so don't forget that. Um, but this is the condo results page and you see here condominium, the promontory, this is accepted without conditions, which that is VA language for approved, which is exactly what we want to see. And I did just want to show you a sample of one that is not approved. If you see where it says HUD accepted, that means that the uh, HOA submitted their paperwork, but they have not completed the process. So just because it says HUD accepted, that means not approved. It doesn't mean maybe or we're in process. It means that there is something outstanding and it's currently unavailable. And so somebody would not be able to use VA financing for this particular project over here. But the sample we're looking at here in the promontory, um, VA approved, that's what it said on the MLS and it is 100% VA approved. So now we've looked at conventional, We've looked at FHA, we've looked at VA, and we say, hey, you know what? My complex is eligible. What am I gonna do? You know what? It's gonna be just like a standard single family home. You're gonna go through and get it under contract. You're gonna get your inspection, appraisal. We're gonna verify credit, down payment, et cetera. And then we're gonna move forward and help the buyer purchase that property. Now, if they're doing a conventional loan, those rates can vary a little bit depending on how much they're putting down you may see the rate as much as a quarter percent higher if that client is putting down only three or five or 10 percent. But if they're putting down 25 percent or more, likely the interest rates are gonna be exactly the same. Now, again, if they're putting down a little bit less, that mortgage insurance might be just a little bit higher as well. Now that's not something, if you're a home buyer or you're a real estate agent, I don't want you to try and memorize that. That's part of what we are going to help you with when you reach out to us to get approved for your new loan. If you get a new FHA loan, it's gonna be the exact same as a single family residence. There's no additional interest rate or cost uh, for a condo and VA exactly the same as a single family residence as well. Okay, so once you know what type of property you have and it is eligible, then you're really gonna move forward just like a standard single family residence. Now, what if your project is not eligible? And that's what this guy, he didn't find out until like right before closing that his project is not eligible. So we want you to avoid that. So make sure you call us, then we'll review that project with you right up front. So if it is not eligible, you're going to need to find a lender that does non-warrantable financing. All right, so this is something that we do depending on the reason. All right, if you're in litigation, no, no we're not gonna be able to help. But if you've got some challenges maybe with reserves or challenges with owner occupancy percentage or investor concentration, depending on the reason it's non-warrantable, we do have some programs that can help as well as other lenders in town. First Bank does a great job, Key Bank, Compass, lots of other lenders do this, but there's some pros and cons to it. One of the things that's really important on non-warrantable, you're generally gonna need a larger down payment. 
usually 25 to 30 percent or more and you're often going to have a higher interest rate all right because there's some problems with the homeowners association the lender is oftentimes going to charge you a slightly higher interest rate in order to make up for some of the risk associated with that HOA. And there's also often going to be a shorter amortization. I know one non-warrantable lender in town who's great, they're outstanding, but they only do 15-year loans. So what does that mean? Your payment might be quite a bit higher versus a 30-year loan. And you may have a shorter fixed period. So it might only be a three or five year arm. And what do all of these challenges result in? Likely a higher monthly payment. So a non-warrantable project is generally going to have a higher monthly payment than a warrantable project. But it's really important. It might still make sense for the buyer, depending on the specifics of the property, their qualifications, the rent, the exit strategy, all these items combined, it might still make a lot of sense. And I teach a great class on investing in condos where myself personally, I bought several properties that were non-warrantable and did really, really well with them because I was comfortable with the risks of that non-warrantable homeowners association. So for me, still did make a ton of sense. Um, just because we can't do the loan on a conventional loan or FHA or VA, maybe a non-warrantable loan may still make sense, but we want to go through all of those details with the client to see what is going to be the best route for them. All right. I hope that this has been really helpful for you. Final reminder here is everything that we do, conventional loans, FHA, VA, USDA, jumbo loans, investor cash flow loans, Everything we have discussed today for condos and townhomes, you can do on a purchase, a refinance, primary residence, second homes, investment properties, and even, of course, our home equity lines and fixed rate second mortgages. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok. If you have questions, you can call me, 303-809-7769. Of course, you can email me, jmassey at castlecookmortgage.com. Don't forget to scan the QR code here. You can download our mobile application and our mobile mortgage calculator where you can be looking at properties and type in the purchase price range, type in your down payment, type in the homeowners association dues, and it'll calculate really, really accurately for you what is that monthly payment and how much will it cost you every single month. And then real estate agents out there, don't forget ways that we can help you. Number one, we have our eight-day rush service that you can close your transaction the fastest available by law. So you could go under contract today, I meet with the client today, and we can close eight days later. Our average time frame to get that final approval is no longer 21 days. We're actually getting faster and we are down now down to 19 days. And don't forget the industry average, 51 days. So we can finish your loan a full, what, three, four weeks in advance of the industry average. We've got our 100% pre-approval track record that if we've given your client a pre-approval, that transaction will close. We make sure to do all of our homework and our due diligence right up front to assure that client that they can purchase their new property. If you're not familiar with HomeBot, it's our great set it and forget it database that you can use to keep in touch with your uh, prior database. We've got our great e-flyers and our websites to help you market your listings. And then of course, what you're doing today, all of our classes we teach in person and we're getting these all put online to make it easy for you to get out here and get get more knowledge so if you have questions call text email put a comment down below uh, would love to chat with you anytime really appreciate you spending some time with me to talk about condos and townhomes because this is a very important topic and it's one that there's a lot of confusion out there so i hope i've dispelled some of that confusion if you want to learn more reach out and i'd be happy to chat